All right, happy Friday, everyone, and welcome to another Learning Tech Talks where we are exploring the landscape of learning tech while cutting through the fluff and getting the questions answered. You need answered. I am joined again by J.D. Dillon, and you know what? He's gone full circle with his with his undergrad. He's back. He, You know you've made it when J.D. turns on three lights, three lights to do an interview with you. I'm excited to talk with J.D. We're going to be talking about frontline workers. We're also going to be talking about the nuance of this whole hybrid workforce and what it means for L&D. I'm not 100% sure exactly where it's going to go, but I'm looking forward to it one, one way or the other. So thanks for joining me again, JD. Glad to have you back. Thanks for having me again. As I said in our pre-show, most people get two lights put on the backlight for you, Christopher. So you know what? full three-point lighting today. I know. I am I am honored. It is an honor and a privilege to be able to see JD in full studio, in full studio setup. This is a once in a lifetime opportunity. So <laughs> while how we're, am you I, know, if you've how watched I not come across, this? there's no way people don't think I'm the most egomaniacal person in this industry. <laughs> right? with, with intros like that, it's just like, oh, here he goes again. But anyway, you know sorry. what though? Here's the thing. Anybody who would say that, I would say you need to get to know JD then because you don't <laughs> know him very well if you actually ever, ever thought that. Now, what's funny is I was looking back in prep for this I was looking back and I'm like, people might actually think, is this the same interview? Because if you just look at the pictures, aside from my really fancy kind of moving background behind this, it looks very similar to previous ones, although your your lighting is so much better. <laughs> so much better, JD. So anyway, but let's, let's get into it because we, we got a lot to talk about. We're going to have a hard time wrapping this up in an hour. I have no doubt. But for those who may not know this very familiar setup for you, and for those of you who are watching, just so we know where you're at, JD, where are you in the world today? I'm at the Magic Kingdom. Uh, Magic not Kingdom. quite, n it's not really even not that much of a Not the one everybody joke. thinks of. <laughs> no, I literally am. Because it's actually, if I say I'm in Orlando, Florida, that Orlando is a large metropolitan area, right? okay. a bit sprawling. Uh, the most accurate way to put pinpoint me on a map is just go to the Magic Kingdom at Disney World because I am literally right behind it to the point where every night, somewhere between 9 and 10 o'clock, explosions because fireworks show. So I can see fireworks out of my you second floor window. You can see the fireworks at Disney every night? I can see the fireworks every night. And there's something called the electrical water pageant. If you've ever been to Disney World, this um, kind of old school water-based parade with lighted floats that goes across the Seven Seas Lagoon in front of the Magic Kingdom, I can hear the music. So that's how close I am to the Magic Kingdom. So it's more appropriate to say I'm at Disney World. Oh, my word. Not. Well, that, see, now that, see, I learn more about you every single time we talk, JD. And I have to say, Maybe maybe I'll have to pack up our 12 passenger van and make a trip down there. And then when we go to Disney, I'll, I'll swing by and just say, hey, I got to I got to see the 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 Dylan studio. <laughs> it gets much less exciting if I spin the camera just a small amount, just right? ever so slight small amount. But I uh, yeah, I do. I, this is an open offer. If anyone's ever going to Disney World, it's like, how does this work? I know some things. I worked there for 10 years okay. and I've lived here for ever at this point so ever you know all right regular. all right so live from disney studios <laughs> jd dylan and i am where i always am with fred here in in wisconsin um so let's switch over to the icebreaker question jd you've had a little bit of time to think about this so what is something you've learned about yourself in the last three months i've learned and i spent a lot of time actually digging into this in detail I've learned that I am significantly taller than every member of the boy band 98 Degrees. <laughs> that might be the dumbest answer that you've ever had to an icebreaker question the on this show. The dumbest or the best? That but might, that might actually 98 be 98 the Degrees, they released a new song recently, and YouTube and its algorithmic bliss suggested it to me, so I had to watch that. Wait, 98 Degrees released yeah. a new song? They Are did. you serious? They're all in their 40s and they're rolling down the street in a vehicle singing a song. And it just made me think a little bit more about 98 degrees. Only in America. And I, for, so I for some reason, started to wonder, how tall are they? Like in my mind, because they're kind of bigger guys. So in yeah. my mind, they're bigger than me. And then I looked it up and I'm like, oh, no, I'm like four or five inches taller than 98 degrees. I don't know what that means about me, but that's something I know now. And I'm better for it. Interesting. Interesting. Well... 
Now, now I have something that I have to look up too, because now I, I have to hear the new song by 98 Degrees. And now, now I can use that as a visual representation to know JD's bigger than that though. And I, I, think, I think where this really <laughs> came from is I think one of the biggest surprises coming out of the current situation with regards to people going remote and hybrid, which is kind of on the agenda to talk about today, yeah. is that the thing we no longer know about one another is how tall anyone is. So I keep hearing as people start to meet one another in person for the first time, people saying things like, they're much taller than I expected them to be because we're all as tall as this box, <laughs> right? It in, is the great equalizer in, in the many case of regards, remote work. It's like it's the great yeah. equalizer. We're all basically the same size. So height's been on my mind and somehow it got attached to 98 degrees. And if I was a little bit more ridiculous for a split second, I thought to myself, would it be funny if I got a 98 degrees tattoo? <laughs> because they all have the 98 degree symbol on their arm. I didn't go much further. Didn't with go that, that far. For a minute, I was committed to the bit. Okay. okay. Yeah. So there wasn't like a 2 a.m., you know, no. late night. JD woke up Saturday morning and went, oh, well, I guess I followed through with that one. <laughs> it might be good that I'm not a dev learn. Did you never know? <laughs> <laughs> I forgot that was going on this week until I saw yeah. a LinkedIn news feed. And then I was like, oh, yeah, no, that's a thing. So, yeah. yeah. All right. Well, then it is good because you probably would have if you were a dev learn this conversation might've been next week and you might've had a 98 degrees tattoo. So, all right. Well, I mean, for me, I think one of the things that was interesting, I was in this, I was in this bit of a paradoxical state where I was torn about whether I wanted to go do either another grad degree or my PhD. I don't know why I really have absolutely no reason to do it, but it was always this kind of like, maybe like, I don't know, kind of a thing. Cause you know, six kids and, and everything else just isn't enough. It's you need something enough. else to do. What are you going to do with all your free time? <laughs> I know, oh, by the way, you host, time, you host kind of this, thought, like, I do think people I know was... you have a job. <laughs> yeah, I do. I do. And so I was kind of torn on this. And then I, it, over the last two months, I decided, you know what? I, I don't think I'm actually going to do that. I actually decided I'm actually going to make a final conclusion, although I've done this in the past before and then I revisit it. So we'll see how long this one lasts, but I'm pretty sure, I'm pretty sure that I'm not going to go back for any more academic credentials, at least in the formal state. Although I am, I am kind of thinking and revisiting, I, I swore I would never write a book. And now I'm like, mm, actually, I think I might write a book instead. So we'll see what happens. We'll see how this all plays out anyway. Okay, so we're talking frontline workers. Let's let's transition over to this. We're, we're talking about Disney World. We're talking about fireworks. We're talking about ninety eight degrees and and not going back to school. And now let's shift to Exonify. I want to open it up with some of Exonify's latest research because you guys just put out a research report on this, um, and it ties to the conversation on this. So first of all, one. Tell me a little bit about the research report and kind of what you were doing with it, because that, I think that's going to be a natural jumping off point to where we're going. Yeah. So for the last five years, my team at Exonify has partnered with the external research partners to conduct a research study that gives us an understanding of the voice of the frontline workforce. Because I think okay. when you talk about the future of the workplace, and even if that a lot of that conversation very much lives in the world of people like me, where we're talking about things. Yeah, like it's very much work. an office-based conversation. Yeah. It's kind of a corporate world, the kind of how that world is evolving. So rarely does that conversation really get to the frontline space, which, by the way, is where eighty percent of the global workforce works is on okay. the front line. So we've been doing this research effort every year around this time, and slowly over time, because of the changing nature of frontline workplace our research focus has evolved. So in the beginning, it was very much focused on learning and development, right? How do you create great training programs and support programs for frontline workers? And then last year, it was 2020. So obviously, we had to dig into the specific <laughs> elements of pandemic support. So how yes. effectively were organizations supporting their frontline workers in places like grocery, retail, sales, um, contact centers, those types of environments, delivery yep. drivers and whatnot. So this year we went even further in terms of expanding our focus. And we talked about the broader frontline work experience and our, our kind of simplified thesis statement was how you doing, All right? We wanted to understand how frontline workers have been faring and feeling in their jobs over the past year and what types of decisions were they making as a result of how well they felt taken care of, how well supported they were and what was missing. And what was also what was 
working when it comes yeah. to supporting frontline workers. And when we pulled all of that data, I have many spreadsheets and we so kind of dug it. So many spreadsheets. Lots of pivot we, tables, I'm guessing as well. Oh, we could pivot some tables. <laughs> we could pivot and some we stared at the data and the question was, what story is the data telling us? Right. Cause I walked in with certain assumptions. Wait a minute. About, you didn't, you didn't go in and say, I already know what I want the data to say. And so now I'm going to go try and find the answers in the data. I don't think that's how research works, but you know, I, I you know what? Wrong. I don't know. I don't know. JD. I think that is how it works. <laughs> Cause again, <laughs> so I think there, <laughs> you can make anyone who's worked in supported a frontline workforce, just kind of paid attention um, to the, the nature of frontline work can walk into the conversation about their experience with certain assumptions, right? Yes. And a lot of the conversations you see out there are rightly justifiably around things like wages, about yes. how ineffectively a lot of people are paid in frontline work, minimum wage increases, those types of things. Completely yep. makes sense. But we wanted to understand, you know, is that the story? Or are there other layers to the story that relate to how people feel about their jobs on the front line? So when we stared at the data, five themes jumped out in terms of where there were variations or kind of meaningful insights in the data. And those five themes were one, um, the reason people are leaving their jobs. So 45% of frontline employees survey sure. said they've already decided to leave their jobs. And that matches up pretty directly That's with what we see when it comes to, to the other research. Yeah. And the shortage that we see on the front line, what's yep. happening in the yep. corporate space. So there's a general alignment there. So 45% have already made that decision. And then we asked why? What are the motivating factors that are driving you to leave? Compensation is on that list, but mm -hmm. it's not number one. It's number four. So the number one reason people are leaving their jobs on the front line is they're burned out. Okay. Which again, shouldn't be a huge surprise to people. No. But it's, I think it's important to put data and the voice of the employee behind that narrative. So we're not making assumptions about what yep. the experience has been. We ask them directly. So number one was burnout. The second most cited reason was lack of appreciation. Okay. The third most cited reason, which are sitting on the board that you can't quite see behind me, is disinterest in their daily work. Number four is compensation. Number five is being overloaded with work. And number six is lack of flexible working options. Okay. So, so burnout was the theme that kind of drives across the entire report, which is available on Exonify's website, exonify.com. Click on resources. You can find it or just message me. I can get uh, a link to you. <laughs> just and, send uh, JD a DM. He's yeah. good like that. Yeah, I'll help you out. But um <laughs> So burnout was the, was number one. It was the big theme. Second theme that popped out was equity, okay. the disconnect or the differences in experience being had based on certain uh, different kind of demographic factors or or uh, kind of persona factors. So things like gender identification, the okay. difference in management trust between uh, employees who identified as male versus identified as female stood out. Okay. The difference in pandemic support and communication between a full time employee and a part time employee. And the difference in kind of management trust between people who worked in stores and branches and people who worked in other types of environments. So we saw that some of the equity conversation we're having in the workplace in general echoes again in the front line. But then there's other factors about the there's nature definitely of definitely some line nuance work. to it based on yeah. that. Like an example being full-time and part-time employees. I think if, there's some common sense there to say, well, part-time employees maybe don't have the same benefits as full-time employees in a lot of cases. They don't spend as much time. This is maybe not their their full-time gig per se, right? This is an extra thing. So maybe they're not as committed to this job. I get that. I've been a part-time employee. I completely get that idea. Yeah. But the customer on the other side that's working with these employees doesn't know or care if they're a no, full-time they or part-time employee, right? right? So when a part-time employee says that I am considerably less well-informed about changes that impact my job, that's a problem. That's not a nature of being a part-time employee. So the equity factor jumped out at us. Another one was communication, right? The importance of and the impact of effective communication on the front line. And we asked some questions around preferred methods. So digital versus tr uh, traditional means, in-person means, uh, you know, placement, uh, which would be something like postings and bulletin boards, things like that, yeah. versus digital communication. Surprise. Uh, everyone prefers digital communication and access to resources, and it doesn't matter how old they are. So if you want to put that conversation to rest, wait a minute with that. You, JD, you were just blowing up so many things right now. Are you kidding right now? Are you telling me that we can maybe put to bed some of this, I don't know, generational nonsense that continues to circulate? 
shockingly, it's not a Gen Z thing to prefer uh, access to the things you need to do your job on a device that's readily accessible in your flow of work. I don't know. Um, there were, I will say that when you pull apart some of our data based on generations, like uh, intent to leave, that okay. did skew younger. Yes. But that again makes sense because see. people, right? You can just start to think about that. Um, so communication is a big theme. Management is a huge theme. The connection between frontline support, frontline performance, and their direct management. Given that, again, you think about a frontline job, maybe you work in a store far away from the corporate environment, far away from the headquarters, and maybe the face of the company to you in a lot of cases is your different. store manager, yeah. right? is the yeah. direct manager. So the, the role that they play and how much influence they over have over the experience. And you can see a direct correlation between trust in my manager and satisfaction with my management experience and intent to leave my job. Right. The numbers match up. So what's really interesting about this, and again, I want to connect this to some of the Microsoft data, because one of the things and I think we're going to dig into this, we're going to we're going to talk about a lot of this stuff at length, though, is everybody's looking for like the simple answer to this. And, mm -hmm. and there's no there's no simple answer. But one of the things you just said there about the manager in many regards, especially with frontline workers representing the company to to the team in many regards. I think that may, I think if we were to actually look at, if you look at some of the Microsoft data on the corporate side, I think we're seeing some of those similar things, mm -hmm. likely even in the corporate space, because one of the things that's been interesting as we've gone through this pandemic is the relationships of people in their, you know, direct teams have, have gone up. It, they've become very close with their close proximity teams. The relationships that are a little more disconnected has started to wane. Now, granted, I think there's some ways we can counter that. But this actually has big implications on frontline and office workers. This whole idea of the people in their proximity are representing the company to your workforce. And if that's a bad experience, it's not just I had a bad boss. Mm -hmm. This could be this company is a terrible place to work for, which if you look at Glassdoor, I mean, five minutes on there and you just see the repercussions of this. 100%. People love to share that meme or the quote around people don't leave companies, they leave bosses, something to that effect. And yeah. I think that takes on another meaning when you look at the influence that a frontline manager has over a frontline worker, because they have they influence everything, right? Who's responsible for what, what processes are used, what tools are used, who gets access to certain resources and training, what people are scheduled. Do you get that day off? Can you yep. switch that shift, right? It's, it's so much. And having been a frontline manager, at Disney as one of my examples in my background. Um, I know exactly what that feels like from both sides of the equation. So when it comes to kind of connecting the dots between the report and the conversation around what learning and development can do to improve the experience of the front line, one of the things we dive into is, well, how do we more effectively enable managers yeah. to not just be able to execute on the job? Because there's a, there's a reality out there, which is, uh, I don't know the number, but a huge chunk of managers are promoted because they were good at the job. They weren't necessarily promoted because they're good at taking care of people. No, that's I think that's been a that's been a systemic issue yeah. in leadership forever. It's like mm -hmm. you're a fantastic this. I bet you'll be really awesome at leading other people yep. who are doing this as well, which is a I, with plenty of organizations I've worked in have shown that to be very wrong over and over and over mm -hmm. again. So we have to keep that in mind in terms of not just how we enable managers, what management training looks like when we start to upskill managers into those ideas, preferably before they take on responsibility yes. and step into role, but also how management roles are designed. Because if managers, I often say, you know, managers aren't there because they've got manager things to do. So they're not necessarily involved in the training in initiatives and things like yep. that because they're off being managers. But are we building their jobs in such a way where they can focus on their frontline teams physically be there when the moments of truth happen, right? When there's a customer who's not quite agreeable and that employee needs help, can the manager be there because we've maybe looked at their job and introduced automation that knocks out some of the administrative tasks or maybe introduced layers into the team where we've got supervisory people who are working to upskill themselves to become the next manager who can take on certain parts of the workload so the manager can focus on the people side of their job and not just on the hit the KPI side of their job. Well, and and so on this on this topic, because Tracy brought up a good point, and 
it's it is so true that so often this this middle management tier is is often forgotten in in the space and we just kind of go well the, well they'll just they'll figure it out like that's 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 what'll happen they'll figure it out and if anything we've seen over the last 18 months that first of all one they won't if we just leave them some will but that mm-hmm. is a terrible approach to to chain a cinder block to everyone's feet and be like, we're going to push you in the pool. And then whoever floats um, and figures it out, that's great. And you know what? While 89% of you are probably going to sink to the bottom of the pool, that's just the cost of doing business. And I think this is a huge opportunity and it has massive business impact. We talk about business impact all the time in learning and development. I mean, this is an opportunity to make a very quantifiable impact on that. If you don't understand the impact that frontline managers have, you're putting everyone else, so their teams, the frontline teams, the customers, and your business results at the mercy of their learning curve, right? So how quickly can they figure it out? And again, going into my own background, I was frontline management in multiple companies. The first time I became a manager, do you want to know what the promotion ceremony looked like? What my enablement strategy was? (laughs) How I got promoted? Let's hear it. I was handed a set of keys and a radio, and I was a manager now. (laughs) <laughs> when when did I go to the classes? Eventually. So that's one of my yes. favorite things to do is when I work with a frontline employer, I'll walk into different locations and I'll talk to the manager. I'll say, when did you become a manager? And I usually get, an, rarely do I run into, depending on the industry, sometimes I run into someone who says 35 years ago, right? Okay. But a lot of times I run into people who say six months ago. And then I'll say, well, how did they prepare you to take on this responsibility? And more often than not, I hear something to the effect of, well, the management training program hasn't come around yet. So, you know, I'm kind of, I'm calling the other stores and I'm talking to the other managers, figuring things out as I go. You know, I knew some stuff from being on the floor with my old manager. I'm kind of filling in the blanks. Yep. I'm like, I'm all for self-directed learning when it's the right solution to a problem. But in some environments, like let's say that this person's managing a team in a highly unionized environment. We need to help them understand what that means and how to make decisions that doesn't add risk to their business in, in various ways. So that's why I think, a big part of the narrative in our report is how we need to kind of relook or rethink what manager enablement means because of the impact that they have on the frontline work experience and how they can drive retention. I mean, I, hopefully we've all seen how great managers can actually help overcome the limitations of certain jobs or certain experiences yes. just based on how they work with people. Well, and like and I said, it's, it's partially much, learning, it doesn't partially take much job time. Design. If you spend time with your people analytics team, or even just like you said, go out to these places, you mm-hmm. can see that a lot of times the big difference in a really positive environment with low retention numbers, high engagement, high customer satisfaction scores, it's the frontline leader. Yeah. I mean, that yeah. in many regards, same environment, same circumstances, same things. And yeah, there's variables that play into it. But yeah. that person, I love the way you framed it, which is that person's learning curve sets the tone for everything. And and to connect to the fifth theme, because the fifth theme we dug into was skill development and where yeah. learning and development, training, upskilling, reskilling, cross-training fits into the frontline narrative. But one of the things that, that I suggest in the report is we need to look at how we incentivize management based on the development of their teams, right? It's not just yes. your ability to hit business KPIs. Are you setting the organization and your team up for success and building bet strength? Because one of the things I don't think anyone has really talked about, especially on the front line, around this idea of great resignation, reprioritization, any other word you want to put after that that speaks to people, the, the changing relationship people have with their work right now and the decisions that they're making, is that we're having a huge brain drain moment where people who have a lot of institutional knowledge are walking away. But who are, all, who are those people and what did they represent in ter- terms of the bench strength and future capability of your organization? In a lot of cases, the next manager left. So what are we doing from a skill development perspective to start building that strength back and set ourselves up for a place where we're not just delivering the training people need, not just the onboarding, because you'll see stats in the report that talk about how a lot of frontline employees just get training when there's big changes, right? So just when there's new product, there's a big compliance requirement transition, something like that. And then something went wrong and they retrained blew up. We had a incident at a, at a site, and so now we're making everybody go through yeah. this type of a thing versus yeah. the regular cadence of things. And that's where I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hang a, a question mark around a particular set of terminology we use in our profession. It's going to get spicy. Here we go. So, uh, you, know, you know, learning in the flow of work? 
or workflow based learning, any of that variations of that term, I think that's a miss because I 100% agree. And a lot of the things we do at Exonify is about making things more accessible as okay. part of your, you know, it, as you're doing your job. So if you have a question you need to answer, you can get to that answer yeah. without having to walk to a back room, go to a computer you never go to a completely different up. place, completely right. disrupt your flow. Yeah. All of those ideas make sense. I think we have to go one step further. I've, it's about learning becoming part of the job so that just like I'm expected to be able to execute and hit my goals as an employee, I'm also expected to continuously develop and improve. And I'm given not just the resources, but the time and prioritization to do it. And because the incentivization, start, which you said earlier. Yes, 100%. Because when we start talking about the differences between someone like me who works in a corporate environment, works remotely or in a hybrid role, and someone who's working on a frontline position who has to clock in at the store, at the plant, right, at the distribution facility every day, one of the biggest differences in those two personas is time and how time is used, how time is prioritized, how time is afforded. And you and I decided we're going to have an hour-long conversation today about these ideas, and we can make that call. If you work in a frontline role, you don't get to make that decision to say, I'm going to take an yeah. hour to focus on my skill development today. Yes. That's, that's a big conversation to be had because staffing is such that that tremendously disrupts the operation if one person gets removed. And again, as a frontline manager, I remember before I went in l and I remember those moments distinctly when corporate training took five or six of my people out of the operation. And I didn't know why they were just scheduled to go to so, training today. No, you know, this is a really good, this is a really important point to hit on with this because this is one of the things that I think I was excited to have this conversation about is this is one of the risks and you just hit one of them. Now, I think there's some things that we've talked about that do transfer across the corporate frontline things, which I'm going to come back to on the manager side. But that one right there is one that I don't think we pay enough attention to in learning and development from a nuanced standpoint is, is this idea that, yeah, well, in the corporate office, if we need to pull together people for 90 minutes here and there, it's not a big deal. You know, they can just kind of move their meetings around, shuffle their schedule and kind of clear some space to do that. Asking that on the front lines is one, an absolute nightmare on the, it, it can potentially be destructive big time on the customer experience because now it's like, oh, well, only half the staff are on the floor right now and we got customers coming in that where is everybody? Oh, well, they're off in a training session right now type of a thing. But this also contributes to some of the tension and animosity between this idea of, yeah, corporates over here doing this stuff. They don't really understand what we're doing. And we may have the best intentions. We may be like, this is a critical skill that we need to build in the workforce on the front lines but we're not necessarily considering the fact that, okay, but are you thinking about it from an experience standpoint and what you're actually doing? And then you make it worse when it's like, so why are they doing this? Uh, somebody said that this is a really important thing that we need to do. And that's why it's a critical piece of the, of the conversation when you're designing a training and enablement program for a frontline workforce. It's not just what is the best way to help someone develop the skill. It's what's yes. the best way to help someone develop a skill that fits into the reality of their everyday work. Because for certain things, you may need to step out of your operational duties, right? You may need to go hands-on in a dedicated environment. There are absolutely for, times period for that. time, totally. But that should be the exception in more cases than the rule, where can we find ways, and last time we chatted, it was about micro-learning. How, how do we find ways to leverage the naturally available times in the day. So I might've talked about previously working with lift truck operators and figuring out that during their battery charging times, they had 10 minutes. So how do we leverage those 10 minutes to help people yep. reinforce certain parts of their knowledge that are critical, or maybe introduce some new topics and then incrementally, because that's how learning works, incrementally yep. in these couple of minutes a day, start to build up people's knowledge to certain areas. And then when it is time to do something more immersive, we're going to go into a job training exercise, a simulation, right? We maybe need to bring people into a classroom for a meaningful conversation. Those things still happen, but they're part of a more blended strategy where we're leveraging all of the things that we can do in a way that immerses people in learning as part of the job and does not disrupt the operation uh, because again, people don't go to work to learn, they go to work to do the job, but learning needs to become part of that. So what's funny well. about this though, and now is, is 
some of these lessons, and this is why I love focusing on some of the data that's coming out of frontline workers or using frontline workers as a test case, because in many regards, everything we're saying right now, it's not that it's not true for office workers either, right? Just because they have more flexibility to do some of this other stuff doesn't mean it's the right thing to do. And I think we see the consequences of it played out more in frontline workers, which is why it's a great use case to be like, whoa, like what's the impact of this? Because if you're pulling people and asking them to rearrange their schedules and adjust things to go sit in a half day workshop and go, well, but they're office workers, so it works for them. Okay, it's still a terrible approach to do it. And to your point, you still should be looking at what does their day-to-day -day look like and how do we interject guidance and support along the way and support them working is learning and learning is working versus, well, let's just always pull them out to do this. Is there an opportunity to do that? Yes. Is say. there value? Sure. But let's be careful about it and not take for granted that, well, we can over here. So we won't do that for frontline workers, but we will for office workers because they can pull it off. Yeah, and I always say everyone needs the same things, right? Generally speaking, when you design learning and enablement strategy, it's the same ideas where it's everyone needs a place they can reliably go to find information when they have a problem they can't solve on their, on their own. Everyone needs the ability to raise their hand and ask a question because they can't find the information. They don't want to make a guess and they don't just want to rely on the fact the person next to them may or may not know that answer. Right, let's take a they, shot in the dark and right? hope that maybe they know. We need to negate that idea broadly. Everyone needs the opportunity to practice and reinforce critical knowledge and skill so that when the moment of need arises, they're ready and they can apply that knowledge and skill without having to necessarily look it up. It's one of those moments where looking it up isn't a good option, right? Yes. They need coaching and feedback in a meaningful, timely, and personalized way so they know if they're getting it right or, they know, or if they're missing the mark when it comes to applying that knowledge. So the list is the same across the board, regardless of what you yes. do. Which is the good news learn. for learning professionals. Because if you came into this back. thinking like, oh my gosh, I have to have two radically different strategies for frontline workers as a different biological being versus, it's like, no. Yeah, humans. They're people doing they're all work. People right? all working, trying to do a job very similar. Yet the execution of that yeah. is very different. What changes heavily is context, right? So if you're yes. a marketing program manager and you have a problem and you don't know how to fix that problem, you can probably light up Microsoft Teams and directly message the person responsible for that information and get your answer. But if you're one of 400,000 grocery store employees, you're yes. not using Microsoft Teams in front of you on a, on a monitor all day. You can't directly ask the head of that division the question because that person can't scale themselves in order to be able to handle that. So when it comes to helping people find timely information in the frontline context, it's a different application strategy, right? It might be different technology, um, different type of content design, different experience design. Because again, we're trying to fit those same things, the same yes. types of support people need into the reality of their work. And that's where the big difference is comes because if you're a marketing manager, you have a very different day-to-day -day reality than if you're a grocery store employee working behind a deli counter. Well, and you may even, and even going back to your point is the fact that even just the context of, in your example, the marketing manager has some of that 50,000 foot context to even understand, oh, this is the person that I probably should ping and then they also have access to teams to be able to ping that person mm -hmm. directly versus to your point i mean i we've we've all been there on the front lines at some point in our careers and if you reflect back on those times you don't even have the operational context to understand the way things work to even know oh i guess i could reach out to our chief operating officer and ask why is the like why are we going the yeah. That's not even a thought that pops into your head. And I think we take that for granted way too often. And the frontline strategy also has to equally apply to someone who started yesterday. And this yes. is not their career path per se at the moment. Maybe they're just working here because it's a job and they need to support themselves and their family. And then there's someone else in the store who's been here for 35 years and they are that go-to person, right? That person who's got the relationships in the store. They also need support too because... They may know a lot, but they don't know everything and they need to keep pace with change as yep. you know, their 35 years of experience is shifting around them. So you have to build an experience that fits into 
the work realities of all of these different types of people who do this type of work and maybe aren't hired into specialist roles in a lot of cases where you hired the marketing manager as an example, because they are a specialist in their yes. job. You're not necessarily upskilling them on the nuances of their job because they're a specialist. They're they the, handle, they're the expert in that. Right? They're probably they keep pace with their, that on, them, yeah. on their own. They keep pace with their profession. They attend these conversations with marketers, which are probably much less entertaining. <laughs> Um, Definitely much right, less right? entertaining. They're able to control a lot of that development. And, and they have the autonomy in many regards ways. to even know what their path and what development looks like for them, even if it's not perfect. Yeah. Th th there's a little more context to it. Exactly. And the other thing is, and another big consideration for a lot of frontline workers is that marketing manager can make the decision to say, you know what, I'm falling behind a little bit when it comes to SEO and the evolving changes when it comes to browser technology. So I'm going to spend the weekend diving into some of these articles that I saw and really try to understand, listen to the podcast, what I'm out running, all these factors. Flip over to the frontline employee. They may not be allowed to do anything off the clock. Yes. So you have to fit your hard, strategy. If, you're not, if you haven't run into that barrier before, that mm -hmm. is a hard barrier to run into. Exactly. So when it comes to even conversations around BYOD, which I see more and more openings to that conversation, people are more and more accepting of that opportunity today, even in frontline use cases. But if that is still a big conversation point to say, we need to make sure legally that people can yes. only access certain things on the clock at work as compared to when they're at home. But maybe when it comes to um, we want people to access timely communication, right? To get the update, their manager be able to send them a message because something changed in the store. Uh, maybe they're off for a week. We want to be able to keep them apprised of what's going on. So when they come back in, they're ready. But we don't want them to be able to access certain other things because that's more considered work. And they have yes. to be on the clock to do those types of things because people need to get paid for their work. And you need to be, that's a really important, 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 yeah, here we go, um, important factor. <laughs> That you need to, I, I will never, it, you bringing that up actually brings back a very funny but terrifying memory of one organization I was with where this was back when I was not in a position of influence to be able to change this. But one of the strategies was we're going to, and this will date it a little bit, we're going to send all of the frontline workers these DVDs or these audio, audio CDs, this bundle of audio CDs on leadership development and we're going to send them out to everyone and then that way they can listen to them and i remember the conversation in our end coming up going can we ask them to to do that outside of work and this leader going well we aren't going to directly ask them to do it but we're going to kind of passively expect that they're going to and i remember legal got involved with that one real quick and was like oh no you will not absolutely, you are not going to just kind of nudge, nudge, hint, hint. You know, it's not really part of your job to listen to this on weekends and nights off the clock, but it is. Exactly. <laughs> and let me make the low hanging fruit joke that someone out there is making for all of you out there who need an explanation. A CD is a, um, <laughs> oh, yeah. So, so, but let's, let's, let's kind of shift gears on, on this one a little bit, because were there any things that popped up that, that caught you completely off guard? Because one of the things that I thought was really fascinating, well, fascinating, it shouldn't be fascinating, but it is because a lot of times these research reports you see, when you look at who they're interviewing, it's not actually the people that, that the report's even about it's, it's the HR leaders, it's this and that. And you actually sat and talked to frontline workers. So what, what exactly was, was there anything that popped up that was like, I did not see that one coming? I wouldn't say anything, any, any of the kind of high level observations. Okay. So were, the high level observation, cause everything you yeah. said was like, I mean, makes sense. Yeah. So I would ahead. hope. Yeah. I would hope people aren't shocked when I say frontline workers are burnt out, especially right now. <laughs> I think the, the, the important thing to keep in mind is that we're not necessarily looking at brand new revelations either because okay. the problem didn't with burnout didn't start in the past year and a half. No, it accelerated it in the past year and a half. But people like Jennifer Moss, an author that we, that I talk to a lot uh, through Exonify, I'm literally book plug. This is Jennifer Moss's new book, uh, timely released about the burnout epidemic. But um, okay. she's been talking about that topic for a long time. And now she talks a lot more 
about it because people are acknowledging and seeing the impact of it. So I think we knew a lot of things. I think I was curious to, to find out and get validation around where compensation falls in right. the story because it is often the headline. It is often around the headline. Wages. That, yeah. that was actually surprising that it was down the list more given the fact it is top of mind, at least if mm -hmm. you were to read headlines. Yeah, 100% important, right? There's no question that is a Yeah, not to dismiss it. No, um, but I think we've often hear things about, you know, people, you know, do people stay for the money? Do they not stay for the money? So I think getting yeah. data and validation behind that is important, that it falls at a broad level behind something like appreciation, right? That again, saying that it's important to appreciate people for their work, not a sudden revelation, but really digging into what does that mean on the front line? Well, and realizing and how, we how important dots. that is, I think right? it is. We, I think we take piece. that for granted. I think the things that really jumped out at me looking at the data was the level of disparity in certain okay. cases. So I'm I'm staring at the report, for examples, right now. And like I said, I mentioned it earlier, but here's the number. We asked people based on job status, how well informed do you feel about changes that affect them? And the percentage is going to reflect how satisfied okay. they are with, with their um, level of being informed about changes affecting them on the job. Full-time employees, 71.3% were satisfied with how well updated they are, right? Okay. Still a big gap. 30% of people do not feel satisfied with that. Part-time employees, 54%. That's a big jump. So the chasm between those two different classifications of employee, and there's a variety of different examples of that in here when it comes to, maybe it's not, you You might have sat there and said, well, I could see how part-time employees don't work as often, so maybe they're, they're missing some updates here and there, so we do have to think about our communication the strategies. The thing is, I the gap is your thought, and I'm jumping on yeah. this one. Jump. So with that though, and I think this is a, that's a really important stat to call out because while we might say it's easy, and again, this goes back to the beginning of the conversation where I think too often we oversimplify things. And so it's easy to write that off going, well, they're part-time, they're not here as much, they're just missing out on the things and whatever. One, I think your point of calling out the fact that yes, but your customer does not know that. So when they go to ask them a question or they need something from that person, they're not going, oh, well, you're a part-time person. So the fact you don't have any of the answers and you're extremely unhelpful is totally acceptable to me as a customer. That is destroying your customer experience because they do not know the difference there. But I think realistically where sometimes this actually is something that is impacted by us, there have been plenty of conversations where I've been in where we go, where organizations have said, yeah, well, th those are part-time employees, so we're not going to make the investment in the tech because we don't want to use a license up on a part-time employee for this, which there are times that that makes sense. But listening to that data, what you're talking about, there are times that that is a catastrophic choice or that few dollars a month that you might be spending on this person's access to the critical systems and capabilities of the organization or the development or communications things that you go, well, they're part-time. We don't really need to invest in that. That may be costing you 10x what you think you're saving by cutting them out of the equation. Exactly. So I, my hope is that the research and our findings help connect some of those dots, right? To help people ask more meaningful questions and really dig into what is and isn't working in the, in the frontline experience and closes some of those kind of anecdotal challenges that I see. So I don't have data on this per se, but when I go out and talk about communication as an example, I run into a lot of people solving the problem themselves without necessarily telling the company, right? So again, yeah. if I had a nickel yeah. for every unapproved WhatsApp group that exists in frontline workplaces where the store manager started up yeah. his own digital communication strategy because he doesn't have a better way and he knows that that's a problem that's impacting his business. Yep, recognizes but it's a gap. At the same time, he just layered on risk to the business, right? Because if you have an informal technology in play and the wrong thing gets said, the wrong thing gets shared, the wrong, right? Things can happen if you don't have the right strategy, tactic, or tool in place in order to close that gap at, in collaboration with the organization. But that's, yeah. you know, people are taking steps because they see these gaps, but our organization's prioritizing it accordingly. Well, and, and this goes back to the, the just lack of simple answers and the hard work that we have. I mean, that's why they hired us to do this stuff. And we joked about it backstage before we went live that sometimes we're out here looking for like, what's the easy answer to this? 
Like if there was an easy answer, we wouldn't hire you. You wouldn't be in the job because there'd be an answer and we could just eliminate your position. But with this, there's this spectrum of, well, there's things we can control and there's things we can't control. And I don't, it, that dichotomy is not necessarily there. And I think, you know, on the front line, a perfect example, the one you brought up is a really important one that I've seen play out multiple times where in order to avoid risk, companies make decisions to not use certain technology or not go down certain paths because they're like, well, we just don't want to open the door for this type of a thing. Not recognizing that your people are going to do this, whether you enable it or not, when they see these gaps. So the WhatsApp group, if you say, well, we're, we're just not going to invest in some sort of tool that actually allows people to communicate in a controlled environment, they're, they're doing it. They're doing it anyway. And so how can you actually say, well, knowing that's the risk, what can we do to actually mitigate that risk by actually jumping into it? Um, cause I, I just think of an example where this, I, this debate happened when the cloud first came out. I remember that was a big thing. Everybody was terrified of the cloud and the security and failed to look at the vulnerabilities of on-prem and not realizing that the cloud was actually more secure. And I think sometimes you run into the same thing with frontline workers. And I believe in a lot of cases, it comes down to the fact that people may know the gaps exist, right? They, yes. they may want to help. They may know that. An example in L&D, I, I have yet to really run into an L&D team that supports a frontline workforce that says it's a good idea to bury a frontline employee in a back room for three days of nonstop e-learning and yes. then release them onto the job by themselves. I'm pretty sure we all know that doesn't work, but we're trying to work within constraints where the operation says you only have eight hours to onboard this person because I hired them because I need them. Yes. So we're working within constraints and we may not know what all of our options are. So if we're working with the technology, the tools, the strategies, approaches we've historically worked with and applied in other contexts and then trying to shift them towards the front line and we start to see a disconnect and it doesn't fit, right? I use the word fit a lot professionally. So the question becomes, do people know their options? Do people know, you know, just to talk about Exonify that in a tool like Exonify, we've designed an experience for that situation. Specific for that right? environment. Because we know that the list of what someone in a retail environment needs to know to onboard is a long list. But yes. we also know no human being can consume that long list in one sitting. So yep. the idea is not to get rid of the list, but to distribute the list in, in a prioritized way to say, okay, before you hit the floor, before you use the meat slicer, before you get in that delivery vehicle, we are going to hit certain things. But other factors like company culture considerations, additional customer service uh, ideas, the things that are not the absolute requirements, we can distribute across the experience of work because we're embedding learning as part of the job so that when you come in for your shift each day, we're adding to what yeah. you know and building your skill over time, but in an accelerated fashion rather than leave it all on the, on the cutting room floor. Because again, to be frank, if you put someone in eight hours of onboarding in one day, you're leaving most of that on the floor no matter anyway. what, yeah. right? So it's it's helping people understand they have options for deploying training into these nuanced and challenging environments in different ways because technology, AI, personalization, adaptive learning, micro learning, all of these ideas fit into this environment because of the fact we're trying to balance operational constraints with meaningful learning and development practices. Well, and I think your point, and, and this goes back to the, this is the, the push for learning and development professionals. It's actually why I started this show was so often we're operating within the box of what we know. Like I only know this because this is the only technology I've had exposure. I only know this because this is the only, you know, things that I've had. And so then you move into this new environment and you do similar to what you said, you go, all right, well, we've got this completely different use case. So now how do we make what I know work for that? And that's where we end up with this. And it's not, like you said, it's not this malicious, well, I just, you know, I, I think I just want to bombard people with 32 hours of of back-to-back e-learning -back e all at once and drop it on their head. Nobody's going, I think that's the strategy. I think that is the most effective way to do it. But when you don't know what the other options are, what the other possibilities are, it becomes very difficult to do that. And I think that's the hard work we have to do as learning professionals is broaden our horizons. And as one of the biggest influencers to know in learning and development, you must be familiar. Did you know you're on a list? Did you see that list yet? 
<laughs> I think I got tagged in a post once, I, which is I saw, still I saw, I, I saw a list this morning with you on it. So, uh, really you're okay. on the lists, Christopher Lind on all, all the right, lists. No. But anyway, um, it is a noisy and confusing space. Is it not? It is. All right. How many you've done uh, at least 7,000 episodes of the show. And <laughs> how many times have you talked to multiple different providers where you could have almost said like, what's the difference between that and this and that yes. when you probably know there is a difference, but the way people talk about different things, the concepts, like let's just use adaptive learning as an example ask 10 people what adaptive learning is and you get kind of colors Wildly of different variation, um, yeah. right? So, so the idea here is, and the reason that my team explicitly talks about the front line is because of that difference in the persona of the worker, right? And trying yep. to get away from like, yes, we're going to apply principles of micro learning. We're using data to drive a personalized adaptive experience, but they, but it begins with the nature of frontline work, the problems that that audience is trying to solve, and the connection between frontline performance and business results. And then applying the right approach, the right technology to fit into that environment. And that's how we try to kind of mitigate the noise out there around, well, do I need one of those or one of these? Which LMS and these types of ideas? Let's, well, let's focus on the person as opposed to and that's the kind of it. jargon. That is such an important point because this is one of the number one questions I get all the time is, well, what app should I get? Like what platform should I buy? And my answer to that is always, I don't, what are you trying to do and for who, what is the environment that they're in? Because to your point, there might be two platforms or applications that in the marketing jargon look very similar and you'd go, oh, well, I can just pick either one, right? And I would say, no, absolutely not. If this is the environment you're working in, no, if this is the experience you're trying to create or support, you need to actually consider these other things. And and I and I acknowledge this is overwhelming for a lot of people. And I think this is one of the challenges that we have ahead. But the first step is recognizing there is this wild difference between office workers and frontline workers. And that and now again, now you add to the mix in office office workers remote office workers, hybrid office workers, frontline workers, you know, and, and frontline, I mean, frontline had has had hybrid workers for a while and remote workers. I know a fair amount of, you, you look at like frontline sales folks. I've worked with organizations where you go, well, they're frontline customer facing. Oh, and they're remote. They never have any, the, the complexity of this is, can feel overwhelming. But to the point you made earlier, the good news is we're still dealing with people. And there are some universal principles that we can pursue and not get so lost in the, oh my gosh, I'm just throwing in the towel because this is just too much. But there, there's some hard work ahead. We, we can't let it get harder. I think that's, no. the key, that's the key takeaway is that this is an opportunity for everyone, regardless of function, to really take a hard look at how your organization and the nature of the work that people do within it is transforming and how their relationship to their work is changing. And yes. how do we, um, you know, I think a lot of times your people focus on the resignation side of the great resignation or the shortage side of the labor shortage. And there's a certain reality there that I think gets missed. Those people are going somewhere. Right. They're not just like, I'm, I'm some are, but most are yeah. not like, I'm just retiring. <laughs> yeah. The, the 10 million people didn't just go to an Island somewhere and say, I'm done. Right. They're, they're finding other opportunities. They're yes. leaving to go to another thing. So how do we create an experience that draws people in our direction and also helps us retain and grow and develop the people who are still here? And what was interesting is when we started doing the research around this year's report and we looked out there at other stories, journalism, research efforts, whatnot, and just the news of what frontline employers were doing over the course of the past couple of months, especially, we saw a consistency where there was a series of levers being pulled and everyone seemed to be pulling it at the exact same time and in the same sequence, where the first lever over the past year and a half has been kind of taking a hard look at headcount and the role yep. people play in the organization and saying, well, are we going to introduce self-service, right? Do we need housekeeping every day? Or are we going to cut back? Do people have to go to the front desk? Or are we going to automate that through an app? Are we going to have self-checkout? Are we going to still have the same number of lanes? Are we going to automate warehouse operations, right? All of those pieces was the first pull. The second pull was, okay, we now understand where we need people in place. Now we need to look at compensation. 
The third was, okay, compensation isn't working for certain key roles. We're going to offer hiring bonuses. The fourth lever was, we're now going to offer education benefits for low to no cost degrees. And again, look backwards at the news. You see major frontline employers doing the same things in sequence. Yep. The fifth lever that we suggest in this report is the idea that none of those levers I just talked about made the job better. Yep. Right. They added all good things, education opportunities, better compensation benefits, all great things. The next step is to actually take a hard look at the work experience, the work. inclusive of skill development and say, how do we make the work itself better? So we mitigate burnout. So we make it more interesting and engaging. So we yes. add the layers of flexibility and we change the idea of flexibility where maybe someone, because they, they work in your facility, they maybe can't work from home in order to take right. care of your facility. But, but that doesn't mean it, flexibility is off the table. It could be scheduling, right? You could look yes. at different types of scheduling options. You could look at cross-training opportunities to add a variety into the workplace, right? Yep. Flexibility can mean different things to different people. The best way to figure it out is to ask. And that's what we wanted to do to start with this report was let's ask frontline workers what's working and not get that information out so people can take a hard look at their experiences, including their learning and development programs and say, how can we leverage learning and strategy to close some of these gaps? Um, and the, the one other thing I'll say is that right now I'm writing an article that talks about the connection between learning and development and burnout, because burnout is not a problem that learning and development can fix by ourselves. No, but it's not. we can heavily contribute solutions to that overall problem in things like introducing cross training and upskilling, introducing burnout as a conversation in yep. an organization, helping people understand the symptoms and the signs of burnout, especially managers. So is that embedded in your management training? How do we help people in those environments? Do well, people know what their options can, are? We certainly can do a lot more to not contribute to it. And that's and that as well. And that is something that there is a big opportunity for us to say, hey, are we one of the big contributors to that? Because in some organizations and in many organizations, we can be uh, a big contributor to that. But I think your point of there are a lot of ways we can help some of these things, and but we can't do it alone. Absolutely. Okay. Well, as always, JD, this has been a fantastic conversation. I think, you know, again, hopefully for folks, it's both been inspirational and challenging. I mean, because I think that's the reality of the future that sits in front of us. It's, it's inspiring. And I think one of the things that's exciting about technology is the fact that some of these things, and I think this is one of the messages I try to tell to people all the time. There are a lot of things that 10, 15 years ago, we were casting the widest net because it's all we could do. It was the limitation of what was in front of us. And now many of those limitations are gone, but we're still operating off of this. I know, but that's all we can do. And it's like, not really. Actually, we can do better. So I think that hopefully inspires people to think about, well, there are a lot more possibilities. And some of these universal principles they're not changing. You know, you don't need to go out and find a radically different thing, but digging into the information, thinking about what does this actually look like? I love your point about actually changing the work because all the incentives, all the manager improvements we do, all this other stuff, if we don't look at the work itself, it only does so much. You can't stop. You can't pay someone to stop being exhausted. No. Right. And I, my hope is that, you know, this type of conversation, uh, the report that we've released helps facilitate more of a conversation around the connection between learning and development and a frontline audience and creates a space for people who do support frontline workers in their work, whether you just support a frontline audience, or maybe you support a dynamic organization that includes a significant frontline audience. I don't believe there's enough forums for that or enough conversations. You don't see frontline on a lot of conference agendas, right? No. Retail sessions or grocery sessions or manufacturing specific sessions where we can connect the dots between the conversations we do have a lot around learning practices, theory, technology to this very specific and very important audience. And this is where I seamlessly transition into a plug, because if you would like to have that conversation or at least kickstart a conversation and dive more into well, what are organizations doing specifically to support their frontline teams, you should come hang out with me on Tuesday, the 26th at Exonicom Live, because my team is running a a, an online event on that day that highlights stories from a variety of large scale frontline employers and different types of businesses that talk explicitly about 
how they're dealing with the types of challenges that we've been talking about today. We're going to dive hard into the report. Jennifer Moss, who wrote that book I showed earlier, is going to be cool. there to talk about burnout on the front line. So it's going to be a great time. Head to Exonicom, I'm sorry, exonify.com slash conference. Uh, you can still register and come hang out with me and uh, my friends next Tuesday. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, JD. It'd be a great opportunity. And again, one of the stats you you mentioned earlier is frontline workers make up a massive percentage of our audience. And so your point that these conversations aren't having enough and we're talking about wanting to have business impact and, and impact the strategy, this is one of the major ways we do it. So thank you for, for bringing that conversation to light and the opportunity for folks uh, coming down. And we will have you back for sure because these are always fun conversations. So thanks for making the time for cutting it out and joining us from the magical studio of J.D. Dillon. My pleasure. Next time we'll talk about how tall I am in comparison to the Backstreet Boys. <laughs> we'll, we'll both stand up in, in our cameras and we'll see if people can guess who's taller. So <laughs> have a great weekend, everybody.